number of orbits multiplied by 2 times mathf.pi. That's our current angle. Now, we don't actually have to store it in this intermediary little stage, because what we can do is simply, because this is the, whoops, this is the number of orbits here, like that. So there's our angle. If we know how much time has passed since the Big Bang, we know what our current angle is, which we can store like this. But I don't know. But uh, yeah, or one tau. You're right. It should all be in tau, but they like to use radians. Oh, I do love my tau. All right. So that's our angle, which is correct, If as long as we call update with the amount of time has passed since the start. And the nice thing about this, you never have to worry about drift as a result of imprecision. Every time you run this, it sets angle to the most possible precise number. Angle at any given time might have a little bit of inaccuracy because of floating point limits, but that will never build up and lead to any sort of bizarreness along the way. So, cool. All right. So now we've got this, which means now we can get at any point, we can say, all right, what's the position now? What's the position of the Earth going to be in 1.5 million years? Well, you just figure out how many, how many seconds that's going to be, feed it in here, and we'll know exactly where that will be. Mm, precision. Excellent. I think that's our entire definition for an orbital, with one exception. Um, I want to have some sort of way to, like, track the graphic for it. Because I've got a series of little pretty planet graphics that I grabbed from uh, the Open Game Art website. I've got the source listed in here. This file is going to be available to you guys afterwards. We've got a number of planets. They're, they're numbered a little bit oddly. We've got, I don't know, some number. Anyway, so I, what I want is, um, I want just for now, it's just going to be an integer. This is going to be the graphic ID of this planet. We don't know what it is. Orbital doesn't know what it is. There probably is a better way to represent this, but there's going to be this one variable, this one field that we can set to keep track of its graphic ID. Maybe we want strings, maybe we want whatever, but we're going to do this. Okay, so our galaxy here, which is a regular class, we're going to, um, we're going to have a few things. We're going to have a constructor. So this is how you, you construct an initial gravity. Now, one, or galaxy. One of the things I have learned the hard way not to do is don't do procedural generation in any kind of constructor. I mean, we could have, you know, a secondary constructor galaxy with something like integer num stars, you know, this sort of thing, and then we could, you know, run a generation program at that point. Um, but I found that, like, when it comes to, like, saving and loading and doing different things like this, you want to be able to have a constructor that definitely doesn't do anything other than maybe, you know, in uh, instantiate um, some sort of list or, you know, that sort of bookkeeping stuff. But don't do your generation there. Instead, you really want something like um, a generate function like this. You know, and, yeah, here might be a good place for int num stars. So have some sort of generator like this, which is different from your instantiator, which does mean this has to expl be explicitly called, but it'll be called only in the time when, yes, you're supposed to procedurally generate an entire galaxy as opposed to load one from disk, right? So contract, contrast something like public load, load from file string file name. I mean, we're not going to do this in today's example, but as an example, you may want to do this instead of generate, All right? So it's good to decouple from constructor. So constructor is just there to like instantiate maybe, you know, array objects or other bookkeeping objects you might care about or reset numbers to zero or do, I don't know. I don't know what you want to do, but something else. So. Our generate function over here, we're going to generate some stars. For To start off with, I'm only going to generate one. So I'm going to have, I don't know, public. Uh, we want some dot generic like this. We're going to have a public list of orbital. These are going to be our solar systems, which will orbit the, um, the galactic center. Okay? So I'm just going to generate one. That's it. So our solar systems, we're going to make a... Uh, new list. Actually, this is a good example of let's instantiate the list over here in our constructor. And over here, we can just say uh, we're going to make an orbital called solar system, which is going to be a new orbital, uh, which by default just has a bunch of zeros. It has no information about where it is, and that's okay. Solar system 
dot add. We're going to add this one in there. That's it. Um, we will tell this thing uh, that it's just going to be a single star at the center of our gal galaxy. So that's an interesting point. Right now, time to orbit. We do have a division of time to orbit, which could be zero by default. I'm going to force it to at least be like one or some damn thing like that. So let's make a constructor here. Public orbital. I mean, I could instantiate it here to some default, but it's okay. Just avoids that problem. If we end up with a time to orbit equals zero, we'll get a crash. We may want to have that in the property to babysit that it you know doesn't get set to zero or some other damn thing, whichever. It's okay. So we're going to create some sort of default thing. Um, it's just going to be at the center. We're going to have one solar system. We may not represent the galactic view. I don't think we're going to do that in this particular tutorial, but that's okay. So we're going to add that. Um, so that gets added to the list. And then we're going to tell our solar system that it should... We want to generate a solar system for this. So let's make a solar system with a single star and single planet for now. Or do we? I don't know. So we've got like this make Earth. What I think we're going to do is I think this would be a good example. Yeah, this is a good case for us to go and add a new file. No, not add file. We want add new file. There we go. Uh, an empty class. This is going to be called star. I'm going to make this class like this. It's not going to have a namespace just because we're not getting that by default, so that's OK. I'm going to bring that down. This is going to be derived from orbital. Um, it doesn't need a constructor. All it's going to have is a public void generate, uh, which um, actually it's solar system here. Solar system, generate. Make a single star with a single planet orbiting it. But this would be a good place to like add in more proceduralness with randomness, but we can build up from that quite easily. So we have, um, we're going to have a internal, just a private uh, orbital called, say, my star, like that. So do we even need to track this? Yeah, we probably need to know what our children are at any given point. Like we track our parent, but we probably need to keep track of who our children are as well. You know what? Let's do that. Public um, list dot generic public list orbital uh, children. And we'll make it public. That's okay. It's fine. And in our constructor, we'll just make sure to instantiate that like that. Excellent. So we've got that. So over here, uh, so I don't need to know what my star is. I just need, know that I have a single child. So we are going to make an orbital called my star here, uh, which is a new orbital. Um, it's going to have a distance of zero. It's going to have whatever. It has um, dot uh, graphic ID. I'll set it to like whatever ID zero is, is going to be our star one. Just, just to hammer that in, that's going to be OK. And what I could do is I could subclass, I can make a subclass of orbital called star and go something like instantiate a star here and then tell it to generate a planet. We're going to we're gonna leave that off for now. We're just going to make a new orbital here called planet, which is a new orbital. And I'm going to tell this planet to make itself look like the Earth. And we'll set the graphic ID to be equal to whatever one is. That's going to be fine. Um, and then we're going to say something like this. We're going to say, so first of all, my star dot parent is equal to this. And this dot children dot add my star. This seems like the sort of thing we actually want to have in orbital some sort of function for. Something like public void add child, which takes an orbital. It sets the c dot parent to be equal to this, and children dot add c, and then maybe a public void remove child, uh, which takes an orbital c. C dot parent is equal to null, and um, children dot children dot remove c. This can throw an exception if there's no c in children, which is fine for our purposes. We want to throw an exception um, at this point. We may want to do some other checking instead, but most likely it means there's some problem somewhere else. So now, instead of doing it this way, I can say 
after I create the star, I can say this dot add, oops, add child, my star. And this planet, I want to be able to say my star dot add, ch add child planet. All right, so we have a little bit of a system there. That's going to be okay. Exceptions are good. Um, what are we going to do next? We are this update routine. I think what it should do is it should also update all of our children. That seems pretty reasonable. Because if we've been updated, our children probably should be as well. Yeah, I think that's okay. Uh, so we could do a for each loop that technically leads to a little bit of extra garbage collection, and I'm bad for doing that all the time. So instead, we're going to use a regular for and i, which is less than children dot count and children i dot update time since start. There we go. So we'll do some of that. All right, so now we get this cascading system, which is fine. We'll probably want to make sure never to update the entire galaxy simultaneously. Like, if the galaxy gets an... I don't think there should be a galaxy update. Because that would update all stars and all planets. It might be a little crazy. Instead, you probably only want to update in real time the one that you're looking at. Or, you know, depends on what kind of mechanics. In Aurora 4X, for example, most solar systems are 100% dormant and aren't even generated until they get visited the first time. From that point forward, they get updated in real time. But until then, they, they're they literally empty until you visit at the same time. Um and in something like a No Man's Sky, the procedural generation, like, it doesn't do anything other than exactly where you are at that time, which is perfectly fine for that sort of game. Uh, -da 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 I think we're okay there. Killing a child is easy. Killing them efficiently takes a programmer. Oh my. Oh my. So at this point, if we did generate a galaxy... Um... Oh, yes, you are generating a new star, not a regular orbital. You're generating a star. No. A solar system. This is the wrong file name. Boom. You're generating a solar system. Uh, so over here, we're generating a solar system. Well, we're making a new solar system. We're telling it to generate itself. And then we're adding that to our list of um, solar systems, which are really just orbitals. But I guess since we know for sure they're going to be um, solar systems over here, we'll change our list type. And that's going to be okay. All right. So we've got that. Now, let's get these to show up which is something that we don't do yet at all. Well, we don't even generate the uh, the galaxy. For all I know, there could be some sort of horrible, horrible disaster going on there. Let's take the console. We're actually getting compilation errors. I do not need the animator. Um, what, did I also close my game view? Oh, no, there it is. Uh, I'm going to split you like this. That's going to be fine. Oh, it's because I made this a double. Let's just make this a float. That's going to be okay. Because we regenerate the angle with precision all the time. We don't have to worry about losing a little bit. Um, we're trying to convert a double to a float over here. Okay, are we? Double to float. Is math.pi a double? Oh. Yes, it is. Mathf.pi. There you go. Because if you include using system, then you have access to the math library, which by default uses doubles. Um, the math F library is part of Unity, and it's just designed to use floats, um, which can potentially, it makes little things maybe a little precise, less precise, but a lot faster, which is going to be fine for now. So now I don't think we'll get any more compilation errors. Where's my Unity there? I lost it. There it is. Excellent. Okay. So let's go ahead and make... Um, what we're going to do is we're going to have it set up so we're just going to look at a single solar system at a time. So we're going to have some sort of object here that's going to be our solar system view. That's its job, is to show us a solar system. We're going to create a new script over here, which isn't going to be part of our models. It's going to be part of, I don't know, our, our views or something like that. And it's going to be called solar system view, and it's going to be added as soon as it does internal compilation, it's going to be added as a component to this game object over here. So this, unlike the rest of our classes, this is going to be a mono behavior. Its job is to, um, to be part of a game object. I don't know why it's showing these things in red. There we go. Compile that. Um, and it wants to lock into a, solar, a single solar system and represent that for us. So um, probably what we also need to do is have some sort of script that holds all of our, our information. So let's have some sort of like, 
I don't know, our game data object, okay? And actually, let's make a script for that. Or game controller is much, much better because it makes a lot of sense for what we're about to do. So we're going to have an object called game controller, and I'm going to have a script called game controller. One, two, three. Drag it onto there. All, it's, all the game controller is going to do is spawn our galaxy for us. So it's going to have a public property called galaxy that holds a galaxy. And on start, it sets galaxy to new new galaxy. And then it says galaxy.generate. I'll get type. It's autocomplete sometimes, a little funny. I don't know what prioritizes some of the lower end stuff instead of higher end stuff. So it spawns a new galaxy, it tells it it should generate, and does that. And then what I also think I want to do is something like, um, no, we don't need to know the current galaxy, the, the current um, uh, the current solar system we're looking at. Tell you what, let's do this one on enable. On enable happens before on start. So if we do this, that means by the time start runs on any game object, the galaxy will exist. That way, our solar system, what I want to do is I want to say something like, I want to find, first of all, I want to have our game controller called uh, GC. Uh, is that going to be confusing with garbage collector? No, it's fine. So on start, we're going to find GC. Game object dot find uh, object of type game controller. There we go. So we've got access to that. And we're going to do something like solar system, solar system. So our solar system is going to be the um, equals GC dot galaxy dot solar systems. We're just going to grab the first one hard coded in. So that's the one we're going to try to display on the screen. That's that. Um, so, or you know what I'm going to do is a little function here that says something like public void uh, show solar system int index or solar system ID. There we go. Is going to be what it is. And then we're just going to call this for value zero. So we just make sure to set our game controller. Then we call show solar system zero. So we set our pointer to that. Then what we're going to do is spawn a graphic for each object in the solar system. That's that. So here's the thing where you can differentiate between 2D and 3D. In our case, what we're going to do is I'm going to make a new game object. So um, we're going to start with the base solar system, the, the star itself. Um, yeah, I guess, okay. Here's what we're going to do. For... We need a bit of recursive, or are we? Well, let's start by spawning the sun and then figure out the rest later. For solar system dot uh, children dot count. So we're gonna loop through each of the solar system's children and we're gonna spawn a game object. Geo equals new game object. It's Presumably not going to have a name, although at this point it's really we're spawning the sun. The first time through we're spawning the sun. We're going to tell this game object uh, that its parent is going to be ourselves. So every one of these graphics that we spawn is going to be within the solar system view. We are going to add a component for a sprite renderer. So this is how, why it's going to generate a 2D graphic. And this will actually return the new component, SR. And all we have to do for this to be visible is set SR.Sprite to be something. So let us get let us get a collection of sprites. So I'm going to make a public array of sprites called sprites. Let me comment this out here. And flick back to Unity over here. So if we look at our solar system view, Oops. Oh, num stars. Uh, one. I think we actually end up ignoring that over here. Yeah, we do. So let me do a little 
just technically so it's there for int less than num stars. Then we generate that. Okay, so now you should no longer complain. Yeah, all right. So our solar system view has a spot to hold a bunch of, of sprites. So here's a good trick to drag a lot of things at once. Lock onto solar system view over here, then click this little lock icon. I know it's very hard to see, but it's right here in the inspector, the lock icon. Then no matter what I select, I'm still locked onto the inspector for solar system view. So then what it allows me to do is click on the planet and then hold shift and click on the last planet and drag all those bad boys into the sprite array over here. So now I have an array of 16 sprites. Mmm, very handy. Then make sure you unlock the inspector, otherwise you'll be very confused later on why things don't respond to your clicks. So now you can see the inspector is once again changing things. All right, so now we have an array of all these sprites in there, and we're gonna treat uh, the first one list as our sun graphic because we're not, you know, we're not going in very fancy with organizing this. So our solar system view is gonna grab, so this is where we're generating all of our, of our sprites, right? Or all of our children inside our solar system view. We're gonna set the sprite to be equal to the sprites with an index equal to um, the solar system child. Let me let me just temporarily put this in something. Orbital O is equal to the solar system children of index I, and then I can say I dot uh, Yeah, I was gonna say compile. You should be okay. Oh, sorry, not I dot O dot um, graphic ID for whatever that might be. There's, there's a million different ways to keep track of these graphic IDs and a better way to organize it, but this is going to work for now. Um, so there we go. So if I were to run this now, we should get one and only one object in the middle of our view, which technically represents the sun, even though it's going to have some, whatever the, um, whatever planet 25 is, what's planet 25. Yeah, that's, that's horrible. Let's, can do we find one that's like, I, we may not have one that looks kind of like sun-like. All right, well, I mean, this is more Mars, but let's pretend it's like um, a red planet. So in our solar system view, we're going to drag system or planet 29 to the first slot because it'll be nice and red. And then which one looks most Earth-like? There we go, planet 27. So I'm going to make sure that planet 27 is our element one because that's going to be what gets set to our planet. So if I run this now... I don't know, I'll probably get a horrible crash. Or maybe it'll just work. Hey, hey, all right. Our solar system view spawns a game object just set to a sprite. Currently, it doesn't track any updates or anything like that, but hey, that ain't bad. Okay. Now, we only generate the thing in the middle. So let's make sure that for each one of these suns, we then go down and do all of its children. And maybe that would have to keep chaining. So instead of doing it in a single loop in show solar system, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have some sort of um, make sprites for orbital. Yeah, so it's gonna take an orbital, which we'll call O. And so this over here will get moved into there. So what we do is simply call make sprites for orbital this. So we make the sprite for it. And then what we do is say for um, orbital.children.count. So for each child of this orbital, we then further call that um, based on O's children. So then we call this recursively to generate. So first it generates all the suns, right? This is this first call generates all the suns. Then for each one of those suns, it would generate all the planets. And then for each one of those planets, generate all the moons and so on and so forth. Fine. There's different ways to like go through this, but this should be relatively okay. Now, one of the things that would be nice is if instead, because if we do this now, let's see if this runs. Everything will still be in the same location, piled on top of one another, but let's see if this runs. Hey, we got two game objects. And I could grab one of these and just move it out of the way. That's our Earth-ish. So we've got a sun and a planet, but right now, both of them just get parented to the solar system view. So instead, I think it would be very nice if we could keep our hierarchy organized in such a way that we said something like 
game object, or sorry, uh, transform, um, and we'll just call this the transform parent, like that. So we go this.transform to get started. And uh, we set the game object's parent to be the so-called transform parent, which actually should be a lowercase t. And then when we call make sprites for orbitals, we then instead of passing transform parent, we pass the new game objects dot transform. So now when we run this, chuka chuka chuka, compile compile, I'll probably stop running. There we go. So we get this nice little structure. Now everything's still spawning in the same location because we're ignoring the information about the data and the angle. But we already get that calculated. Uh, why do you prefer loops instead of for each? I actually much prefer for each because I think it looks really sexy, but it technically because in the background there's um, um, enumerators that get tracked. If you're doing it for like a very large structure, you can end up with a little bit of extra garbage collection um, and other people like complain when I do it. So it's a little bit more performant. Also, um, if for any reason you need to make any sort of changes to the um, the array, I mean, it's still weird and bad in a sense to make changes inside of for loop, but it doesn't like go horrible like you would inside of a for each. So that's all. Okay, so we got that. So what we need to do next is after we set the parent, set our position. So what's the position? Well, the game objects dot transform dot position could be set to the orbitals dot position, which is a vector three, right? Let's run this and see what happens. Well, uh, our sun is still there in the middle, which is great because we initiate it with an orbital distance of zero. That's good. Uh, our planet's definitely not there anymore. Where is our planet? Well, obviously our planet is insanely far away. Insanely far away. It's somewhere, actually, yeah, due to floating point precision limitations, it's recommended to bring the world coordinates within smaller range. It's at 1.5 times 10 to the 11th power far away, right? 150 billion meters. Unity doesn't really like to deal with numbers quite that big for its display. It's way, way off. Um, yeah, it's way, way up, up, because we set our angle to zero to start off with. So it's 1.5 billion world units off the screen that way. Obviously, that's not quite right. Now, maybe we could zoom out the camera enough to do that. Um, that would be work. Another thing that you could do is you could take the solar system view and you could scale it down. But again, then you'd still be scaling it down by an apocalyptically tiny floating point number, which has precision problems. And Unity will still be like, these are really big floats that are probably going to be imprecise. What if instead of setting the position as is, what if our solar system had some sort of scaling factor? Or maybe a zoom level. I think, I think people like the idea of a zoom level more. So let's say we had a public int that was something like zoom level. And we're going to default to something like um, 1 million. So 1 million meters will equal 1 unit in, um, in Unity world space. So then if we do that, so we're at times 1,000, or times 1 million, right? times 1 million zoom right now. All right, I got the zeros right, yeah. So then over here, when we set our transforms position based on the vector information that we're getting from whatever, we could just divide it here, like that. So what happens if we run this? Oh, we got a tip in. There may have been more than one. I didn't realize my volume was so low. My bad. Oh, no, I didn't. Terje, hey, Terje sends in the tip. Thank you very much. It says, magic again. Typing words into one screen makes pictures pop up on the other. Magic, I tell you. It is witchcraft and sorcery. So if I run play on this, and we take a look at our new object, well, we're still at 150,000 for a Y, which is still a little bit much. So let's assume we want like a billion. Actually, even that's going to be too small. Um, And then we're going to start to run out of possible zoom levels over here. That's OK. Run this. Oh, oh. Oh, it's public. Hold on. It's a public. So me changing things here will not change things properly because it's part of the inspector, um, which is sometimes confusing to me. So I'm going to switch this to a billion. 
So now our planet has a Y rating of 150, which means that we can see it. And in theory, I could zoom out enough to see both over here. Still a little crazy. Now, obviously, this is not quite going to cut it. Let's change this to like very large numbers or multiply it by something else. Let's assume we want a much bigger zoom level. I don't know. I don't know. Let's let's make it explicitly. Let's make it a um, um, an unsigned long. Uh, so this is at billions already. Let's make it something like actually, let's make it something like 150 billion. One, two, three, one, two, three. This is 150 million. So one, two, three. So this is 150 billion zoom level, which again, I'm doing here instead of in the inspector, which means it's not taking. So if I do this, this should set the distance between the sun and the earth to one. And there it is. And the advantage of doing it this way is that um, the planets don't scale because that's one of the other problems, right? If you were to just zoom out the camera, then yeah, the distances between them would sort of shrink on your screen, but the planet graphics would start to shrink until they were tiny little dots and sub pixels and just disappear. You wouldn't be able to see them here because technically each one of these should be incredibly, you should be zoomed out so much that it's like, it's ludicrous, right? Let's, uh, let's bring this down, um, something like this. So now it's going to be about three units in between. I think that'll look a little bit better. But there you go. So by changing the zoom level, you can affect this. And the nice thing about it is you could do this live. Right now, we don't do anything in the update. But why not um, loop through each of our um, orbital images and update their unity position. Oh, that is really loud. <laughs> Uh, based on uh, an uh, zoom level that might have changed. Maybe that's not a right place to do it in the update. Maybe instead what you want is some sort of like uh, public function here that's something like set zoom level and you take in some sort of number over here. Um, you know, uh, you long zoom level, set it there and then, you know, update. Uh, so zoom level oh it looms out levels to this and then update uh, planet positions you may also also consider scaling the graphics up down make the graphics um, uh, but keep the minimum size Uh, so for example, figure out what, um, uh, what scale means that each planet will always at least be a few pixels big, no matter the zoom level. Right, because that way you could always see the planets. They start to just get closer together. Then as you zoom in, they, they're, so they're basically dot, 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 dot. And as you zoom in, finally, they start to expand into something a little bit more visible. Maybe if you're zoomed out too far, you don't even bother generating regular sprites. You draw them somewhere else. Thank you to all our August patrons, i.e. people who pledged in August and who are supporting videos from September through to early October. And especially these Mic Check supporters. We've got Ole Peter Talgo, Adam Conway, Drazion, Jan Tori Vell, Adjective, Michael McClintock, Aaron Teufsen, Craig Mortel, Julian Auger Lafon, Marius Field Vold, Speedy Savant, Steven Steger, Valiant Cake Fiend, Wes Oldenboiving, Jason Yanity, Kale the Quick, Neil Blakey Milner, and Yukofin, and everyone who's watched, shared, favorited, and subscribed. Thanks for watching. See you next time.